Uh, I would like to speak about the, let's say, the topics and the ideas for the courses which we can run. So please take it as a like a preview of the hot topics which are related to the to the uh, futures of the of the nearly zero energy buildings. So uh, we will speak about the topics. We will speak about the ideas for the for the for the course. Uh, of course, to find the proper topic and to find the right course, right size of the course, it's the critical and crucial point of success of the course. So first of all, my experience, and now I'm sharing my experience because we are running a lot of courses within our society, within the university for long life education. So the something where we would like to invite professionals and people who should take some time from their everyday work and they should stop their jobs and their work and go to the to the seminar, they should find something attractive. That means something what is exciting them, what is interesting for them. Second uh, critical point is that the uh, topic and the let's say information which we share should be adequate to the to the target audience. So if we have the end user clients, that means people who are building their ho their own houses, it's nonsense to talk about some dif difficult equations and something what is too deep in the theory. Vice versa, if you have a professionals who are doing their work every day, they sometimes they are happy to listen something new from the from the theory, from the from the background. What we should be very very aware, aware nowadays, uh, the market is full of fantastic investigations, fantastic new things. They use the technologies from space shuttle or something like that and they give you information. And now I, I hope that I would not, let's say, be in conflict with someone of you, but uh, that there is a special miracle paint where you paint the wall and it is the same properties as the 20 centimeters of polystyrene and it's excellent material, something new. So we should be very aware to publish or to give such information if we would like to keep our reputation and to say we are serious yes, because next day we will say we are not the newspaper where you can say tomorrow sorry it was a mistake <laughs> one zero was more and less and then uh, what is my experience is do not try to save the world in one seminar of course it's nice to cover everything it's nice to speak about everything but what is interesting for the professionals is to give to get the specific information and to split it into different seminars or different different topics so uh, i would like to share or i would like to say about the ideas for seminar topics so of course it could be the technical solutions that means to explain and to say about the new systems about the old new systems because by the way in this time we did not find anything super new because all systems which we use are known already at least 100 years the principles which we use are very old but of course in different time it's in it's in different level of the energy price efficiency and all those things so it's we are let's say recycling the knowledge of our grandfathers and grandparents then very important topic is as i already mentioned and it was in uh, olena's also presentation is the relation between the energy efficiency and indoor environmental quality. This is something that is very important, especially for the architects, for people who are designing the whole building and whole concept of the building, because to see the links and to find the results of existing buildings, it's something that is very, very nice. We are trying to create a matrix. I think that we are now living in the period of the life where we try to create everything like a virtual reality, to have everything in the model, to be able to predict behavior of everybody, to predict the behavior of the building and to study it in advance, not living it in the real time, but we are living one year or some, some time in advance. But to do that, we need the computational tools. And of course, this is a big field and be very interesting field. Which tool, how to use it, what are the, con what are the limits and so then of course news in research research 
I found very, let's say, from, from the professionals, they are very keen, very hungry for information, what is new in research. Of course, we should be very careful because as you, as you will see at the end of my presentation, I will try to give you some example of the news from the research, which are maybe not so surprising, but it takes two years of work in the laboratories and the result is something what you can maybe expect, but you should be sure that it is as it, as it is. Of course, news in legislation, because I don't know how is it in your countries, but in Czech Republic, every two, three years, the rules are changed and new EPBD is coming and new impli uh, everything is changing. So it's a con continuous change of the laws, of the regulations, which is for the professionals destroying because professional needs to work. He needs to design the buildings to work in the way which he learned before. And now if you change the laws and legislation, it's very difficult to absorb it, to adopt, to use it. And of course, the time scale, because some legislation is already already valid from the moment when it's issued. Some is valid next year and so. So to follow all this is a very good topic for the, for the, for the seminar. And then what we found as a very, very useful is the cross-disciplinary approach. That means to make a seminar for engineers, which is given by architects and vice versa. This field where the, I don't know how it is in your countries, but I think it's all around the world that the architect is a little bit with some kind of the fight with engineer because architects is creating nice buildings, great ideas, very high level ideas, and engineer is putting inside some pipes, some machines, noisy <laughs> things, some chimneys on the green roof, which should be like nicer terrace and some chimneys are going there and some pipes and so and so. So it's all the, all the time some friction and vice versa for engineers. Uh, it's very difficult to communicate with some architects because he says, okay, so my toilets will be in this floor here, in this floor it will be here, so my pipes for the drainage will should do, should do something like that, how to solve it technically. So that's the cross-disciplinary approach, which is absolutely necessary in this type of the buildings, because on other side, what we are trying to create the buildings, which will be not only efficient, healthy, and, and all of that, but also simple. We are not going to create, I think, building which will be like a very, very super uh, spaceship which will be equipped with thousands of equipments, thousands of machines, because all those things are sensitive, need maintenance, need something. But it's the philosophy which is for each of us so special. So from the technical topics, let's go briefly what the minds which or the ideas which, which I had in my mind when I was preparing this, this lecture. So we can speak about the energy approach or low energy approach on the urban scale. And we have very nice topics because what is great idea to have a low energy buildings which are not in the city, perfect. We can create a zero or positive building and so and so. But if you imagine that in garage of such building are three SUV cars, one for mother, one for father, one for the son or daughter, and they travel every day 50 kilometers to the city to their work. So they, the, the car is running every day 300 kilometers, that's three cars. And you calculate the amount of energy used by the cars and production of pollution and all those things. So then our things or our let's say, discussions about the buildings itself is absolutely nothing. So it's good one of the topic. Second, heat islands. Again, it's known topic. It's Mat Santa Moris presented when I was small child, maybe when I was a student, when I did my PhD thesis, it was already a hot topic. But of course, in different times, it's different important. At the times where we did not uh, think too much about the energy and it was not the main issue, we go, okay, our systems will, will adopt to the heat island and so. Nowadays, if you imagine that in the city you have a two or three degrees higher temperature than you expect, and your heating or cooling system is working not with temperature difference 32 to 26, what is the design temperature in Prague, but it's working with the temperature difference 35 to 26, so it's 50% more. So it's something that is very important. And then we make our calculations, we are surprised with some results, because oral calculations are based typically on the meteorological data, which are taken from some 
meteorological station, which is typically located in the place where it is not affected by heat island, because it's not in that city inside. It's somewhere in the forest, in the park, or in some place where it's not affected. So this is something what is important, which could ex explain the difference between, difference between uh, the uh, calculation and reality. From the view of the viewpoint of the energy concept, big discussion, where to go? Is it really a good way to make uh, uh, decentralized energy sources in the buildings? That means vice versa, that in each building we will have a power plant, a thermal plant, cooling energy plant, so we will have uh, such, such devices in each building, or to have it like a central system with the district heating, district cooling, and all, all networks. Of course, its answer is not easy, and it's again up to creativity of each of the country and, uh, and, the, and the location. But both things have the advantages, disadvantages. If you look into the building as a power plant, thermal plant, cooling uh, plant, uh, it's the machine which should be maintained by somebody. It should be, somebody should take care about it, somebody, and the building at the end of the day is much more sensitive to any uh, malfunction or any, any accident in this system, because if it is central, we can expect that somebody have 24 hours supervision about the system. If it is at your home and your system will be destroyed on Saturday night, Maybe you will try to call somebody to come to repair it on Sunday morning, but it's more sensitive. But it's the, it's the question. And of course, the hot topic in this field are smart grids. So we should be aware a little bit in this field because it's mainly the field of the professionals in the electric electricity. If we speak about the electricity distribution network, about the storage of the electricity and then so and so. Uh, I have a lot of experience with colleagues who say, and just it was yesterday, yes, no, on Monday I was in some uh, architecture competition about the new concept of the hospital in one of the cities, and we have a certain designs, certain certain uh, contributions, and the authors those spoke there about the cogeneration and photovoltaic and so with any value, with any number. So it's very nice to say we will supply the hospital by photovoltaic panels. It's nice to write it in one, one sentence. But if you calculate the needs and the energy which you can get from the PV, it's something absolutely out of the, out of the game. So it's important to, let's say, put it on the, on the right, right, right place. Of course, the development in this field is uh, huge. Uh, the policy of the countries is creating different conditions. So this is the re result of the policy in Czech Republic, where our government uh, supported to to, cre to create such fields. So instead of the food, we produce electricity in the field. It's questionable if it is okay or not, but it's, it is. Uh, then you can find some extreme solutions that somebody say, okay, we should increase the efficiency of the PV to rotate the whole roof. It's nice, but the moving of this roof is you consume much more energy than we can we can get by a different orientation of the PV panels. Yeah. And of course, I'm not speaking about the technical details of this uh, rotating. Uh, rotating groove. Maybe in the in, uh, Netherlands uh, they have a skills with the windmills, yes, because it's the same same system, but I think for the new building it's, it's strange. So nowadays we try to integrate the PV into the, into the systems, into the buildings. Regarding cogeneration, uh, nice word. For many people it's uh, like a word which is interesting, sounds good. We create, we produce electricity and heat at the same time, so it's something excellent. Of course, in background is the machine, is the machine which should be maintained, where should we rep replace the oil, where should we maintain the sparks and everything, so it's not, it's not easy. If you will say we will use uh, biogas, it's also nice to say we will use, use it, but in background, uh, in background is something like this biogas station, that means the transportation of the substrate, fermenters, uh, gas holders, 
uh, some liquid substrate, heating of the substrate, production of the gas, and at the end we have some biogas which is which is used for that cogeneration unit, producing electricity and heat for the for the city. So it is just in the background of these large systems where it's easy in in relation to the zero energy, nearly zero energy buildings, to decide okay, let's use a biogas and to use a cogeneration. But in background, it's not so not so simple. Micro cogeneration, that means uh, we are talking now very frequently about the micro cogeneration units which are inside of the building. I think the crucial point of this approach is this diagram which is in your, in your, in your uh, slides and in your USB where it's explained how is it, how does it work and what is the real benefit of the micro cogeneration in the building that while in the normal situation you supply the building with the heat and then you supply with electricity and of course the production of the heat is with some heat losses or it's here uh, electricity is produced with relatively low efficiency so on the level of the primary energy which is here we have some amount of energy and the whole explanation of this micro cogeneration in the building in background is that the energy which is waste for production of the electricity that approximately 60 percent of the primary energy which is like a heat produced by uh, during the production of the electricity in thermal power plants is waste while in the micro cogeneration unit inside of the building we use both electricity and heat and of course there are some some losses so this is the way how to show it and how to display it of course it's question because in the power plants many times now the heat which is produced by uh, as a byproduct as the electricity production generation is used for some other purpose so it's not i don't know what is your experience with stirling engine it's nice device great device which is a machine which is which is working with very good uh, let's say functionality it's it's, it's perfect but the use of that is very, very rare. I do not know why. Because in principle, it's a good system. It's a good, a good machine. It's known 100 years already. So the link machine has been done. Fuel cells, another technology. When I was a student, it's funny because it's 30 years ago. In my, in my class, uh, my professor told me in year 2000, what was something far away in the future, everybody will use fuel cells because we know where the technology is on the it's it's done it's it's ready and it's 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 okay when i was starting to teach i told to my students in the future the fuel cells will be and now my colleagues young colleagues who are teaching already are saying fuel cells maybe is the future but it is not i don't know what is in background why it is not working as it should it could work my suspicion is that is the is the oil uh, lobby and uh, oil system which is in background which is keeping this technology a little bit calm because try to imagine that the oil engines will be out and it, it will not but you can find it again for the applications for the for the buildings for the homes the price is so high at this moment i don't know most of us remember the first laser where laser was something what was oops what was in CERN in Switzerland and nobody had idea that it could be in each pointer and on this table is I don't know I don't know how many lasers and 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 so so the price is questionable wind and another electricity source uh, which is related to such buildings uh, recently has been built in China I think it was two years ago they opened the Pearl River Tower which is partially power plant, wind power plant, and the office building. Skyscraper, I don't know, 70 floors. And in the middle of the building, I'm sorry, I have no picture here, but <coughs> just in the middle of the, of the building is a big uh, vertical turbine, which is generating electricity. It's a nice project, it's an interesting project. Of course, it could be very attractive, but from the technical viewpoint, I would not like to be designer of that. 
because to create such machine which is rotating, revolving in the inside of the building with all vibrations, with the noise, I would not going to the buildings and the building facade. Uh, here in this small small diagram is our requirements on the U value of the building facade in last 30 years. So we are getting to the values which are already limit of the technical possibilities. We can go further, but it's question if it is if it will bring something to us. That means we can add another layers of the thermal insulation. It's possible we can increase the uh, the thermal resistance of the of the facade. It's it's no problem. But the question is that then will appear in the buildings effects which we do not expect. That means all internal sources will be much more than we need, and the building could start to be overheated even in winter 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 period. We can meet a lot of offers and a lot of ideas about super materials like vacuum insulation, like PCM materials and such things. Of course, it's a topic because uh, many questions are coming from people. Should I use it? Is it really good? Is it bad? How to use it? What is the what is the use of this of these materials? So it's good to have a good background of that and let's say the let's say knowledge about how it behaves. For vacuum insulations, I don't know what is your experience. My experience, we did some test bed for one of the projects where we included into the facade of the of the building. It worked perfect, but after a certain period, some stick, somebody put some small hole inside, so the whole uh, segment of this thermal insulation stopped to be vacuum insulation and started to be standard insulation because of just the failure of the human who was, who was maintaining that, that facade. Concerning glazing and uh, glazing systems, this is the field which is, which is a very big uh, future, I think, because uh, in this field is very big connection of the science, uh, chemistry, and of course the building and the, and the industry in this in this field, because nowadays glass is something like very smart structure which is reflecting the heat from outside or inside, depends how you how you will use it. It's able to filter the part of the of the spectrum, and so so it's something what is really progressing, and I think that we can meet all time something new in this field. So it's a is a field which is in the progress. Long time we see, we heard and we spoke about the electrochromic and uh, such type of the of the glazing that means which are changing its properties according to situation outside. I don't know what is your experience. My experience in this field is that it's very slow. The changes of the parameters if it is not switch on switch off with uh, liquid crystals where you can make it like a transparent or non-transparent it's easy but to make it like a reaction to the clouds and to the intensity of the light the reaction time of the systems is too slow that sun is already on the sun and the facade or the glass is still waiting next two minutes to do something. So it's the question. I think the technology in this field will continue because really the window is something what is very big interaction between the indoor and outdoor environment. Uh, I saw recently some new technologies where the window was uh, was equipped with the with the uh, film which was used as a heating. So the surface of the window was covered by the transparent film used as a heating. So we can, it was part of that, but of course that's our very, very advanced things. On this diagram, uh, you can see the existing situation in standard building in, in our country, where the heating demands and heating needs are much less than the energy needs for cooling. So why, while the let's say old buildings, we always talk about the heating of the buildings and the cooling was something that was during summer couple of days and we did not need to take care about it. Nowadays we are moving into the into the uh, into the situation of the cooling of the buildings, and the situation on the market and the situation in the real life is such that many of our low energy buildings, which are perfectly done according to all standards and everything, they have very low energy need for heating, are in summer, let's say, over, over, overheated. 
And what do people do? Because there is no active system, they are going to the next supermarket or hypermarket and buy cheap air conditioning system, which is not included in our nice ideas about the energy efficiency. They just plug it and they cool down the space and they are cold, of course, because it's not smart system, it's one point, one. So it's something very, very important to think about it. That means to look on the building in the whole life, whole, whole, whole uh, period of the of the year. Concerning shading and outside of the buildings, which is big part and which is the basic input for the for the for the for, for our analysis and everything. Uh, we are talking about the smart facades with some uh, moving louvers according to climate, according to weather and, and so and so. Uh, again in this field we can still expect some progress. Because nowadays systems which are smart, which are uh, reflecting to all all conditions, typically work such like one of buildings which is just close to my office, is that the smart system within one hour is able to take off and switch and put down the louvers ten times. So working in such room means that at the beginning of the class, uh, the university building. So at the beginning of the of the lecture the louvers are up and there is no light or no artificial light. At the moment when the sun is starting to shine, louvers going down and the artificial light is switching on. Of course, this transient period takes, I counted it was 25 to 35 seconds. It's a very long time. Try to imagine what does it mean 25 seconds. One, two, three, four. And in this time you are not able to talk because the sound of the louvers is such that it disturbs everybody, everybody's looking what happens. And if it happens 10 times per hour, it's absolutely useless. So it's still field to do something and to find some solution which will be, of course, better. Concerning heating of the buildings, uh, we are getting to one very critical and very special point of the development of the heating system. If you go to the history of the heating, in the climate condition of the Central Europe, I'm talking now about Central Europe, we always had a heating which was running, let's say, seven months per year. We should be ready to have a heating system to, to, to work. In old buildings, the heating system was running all the time in some, let's say, percentage of its output, let's say from 30 to 100 percent and so. Nowadays, even the period is the same, the heating is working for maximum output couple days in a year. This week we have in Prague minus 12, so it works on the, on the maximum out output. But time before, that means two weeks before, and I think in very soon, uh, next, next weeks, the temperature will go up and the heating system should be completely switched off. And now what happens? If we have a hydronic water heating system, the whole system is running, let's say, in the backup or like a free run because there is no need for transmission of the heat from the from the heating system because all heat gains and everything is more than it's needed but the boiler is running the water is circulating in the pipes of course the uh, heat emitters are switched off and the energy losses by this system are so high because it's running with no output with no need for output so it's big question mark if the future of such systems in the buildings is really a future of the hydronic system or we will switch it to some other other system which will be able to be in that standby without energy losses and without energy needs it's a big question it's a philosophical question and we should be very let's say aware how to how to do it yeah. because it has many links to the sources but because in case I will use heat pump, which is perfect source, it's difficult to get the heat from the heat pump other way than by water. Yes, and then we have an efficient heat pump, but we lose a lot of energy in the circulation of the water in the building in that standby, which is most of the year. So then it's question how is it in the whole year efficiency of the of the system. Big discussion is about measurement and control. Uh, even we use um, less and less heat for, for the buildings, uh, we are more and more sensitive how much we will pay for it. Yeah, so 
it's the, it's, the, it's the question how to measure it, if you measure it on each radiator. I don't, in, in many countries now, is the obligatory to have a measurement of the heat delivered into the room, then how to recalculate it to the users. So how to calculate that standby stuff if nothing is produced by heat emitter, but still the heat is coming into the room from the pipes which are in the, in the building. So that's the question. And one of the questions which is related to the heating is the heat emission and is the question of uh, location of the heat emitter. I think that in many, let's say, presentations and publications you found in the modern low energy or nearly zero energy buildings with very good thermal insulation, it's not obligatory, it's not necessary to locate the heat emitter below the window because it could be anywhere in the room, because the thermal insulation of the window is very good, surface temperature is not so low, it's okay. So, of course, it's true, but on the other side, what happens at the moment when I open the window? At that moment, the cold air which is coming <coughs> into the room is falling down to the floor and creating draft, and in case the emitter will be on the other side of the room, it will be completely discomfort in that, in that building. With cooling, so still we need to cool down our buildings. We, it's difficult to do it without without systems because we produce a lot of heat by ourselves. We produce a lot of heat by, by our equipment, so it's necessary to reduce it. So of course we can reduce heat loads in zero or nearly zero energy buildings. We try to do it. Then we try to find some efficient chillers. Then we should think about storage of the cooling energy or cold in some ice bank in case you have a cheap electricity why not to store it from the night today uh, we can store it in the building and this is big question and big let's say challenge for architects how to create a building as it survived some heat waves and some heat uh, the, during the day the overheating that means if the mass of the building is proper then it works by itself. If the mass of the building is low, then we should make some active system which will, which will help, help us. Big challenge is high temperature cooling. That means to use the systems which use the higher temperature of the cooling water. That means not 8 to 12, but let's say 16 to 20 or something like this, which are much more efficient. We do not lose so much. And, but on the other side, we need some large uh, exchange uh, surfaces, like the floor and, and so. Ventilation is a big challenge and big question. Even we know that we need air. I think, again, we are in the room where there is not enough air. <laughs> we can, here, is the, here are the best specialists in the field of the building services and architecture. And after many years and many experience in this field, again, it's the same situation. That means after a couple hours of meeting, the air quality is awful. We are not able to, to breathe. I think we are something about 2000 ppm <coughs> in this moment of CO2 in this room. And we can discuss about it, we can give some good advices, but the reality is such as it is. That means nobody is able to switch on the ventilation system which is installed in this room. I don't know if it is possible or not, but probably not. But here in this room, it's okay at the end of the day, because somewhere is some button which could be switched on and the air quality could be improved here because somebody designed ventilation system which will create or which will supply the, enough fresh air into this room. But in our modern buildings and many buildings, we say, okay, we can do a building without, uh, without mechanical ventilation system. It's just the natural ventilation. We will use such nice natural uh, air movement principles. And I think all of you know such nice pictures of the naturally ventilated buildings. Background of this is the technique and the physics. To be able to do something like that and to as it should run, we need to have some. We have two conditions: either temperature inside should be higher than outside, or there should be enough wind which is helping us to move the air through the building. This is the conditions of the physics. 
So in case that outside is 30 degrees and inside I would like to have a 26, there is no way how to keep, how to, how to force the air to move. So there is a no natural, natural ventilation. In case um, outside is minus 12, inside is 22, that's comfortable, that's nice. And I would like to do something like that, then I should be aware that at the moment when the air which is coming into the building has minus 12 degrees and people who are nearby that openings will be very, very affected by the cold drafts. <coughs> so the comfort in such building is very, very big question mark if it will be or not or how to do it. Of course, it's possible to think about it, to do some simulations, to to design the openings which are in the places where it's not directly affected to the humans, but we should think about it. And it's not just on the level to say, to create a nice picture, which is saying it works and it's nice and we don't need any pipes and that stupid machine machine rooms and, and so and, and so, yeah. Uh, low pressure distribution networks, there is a big now, it's a motion, to not to have the pipes with the ventilation and to use the corridors, to use the rooms as a transportation of the fresh air. No problem, it's possible. That means we use the air from this room, we will transport it to the corridor and we will um, exhaust it somewhere on the other side of the building. It's no problem. But we should create the openings for that air. That means the air from this room should be able to get into the corridor, which is in the behind the door. So we should make the openings. But at the moment, we are facing the problems with the acoustics. We are facing the problem with the air protection. Again, experience from uh, recent uh, two years, our new building of Faculty of Architecture, which is excellent, which is nice, and something like winning all competitions and everything, has this type of the no uh, no no pipes transportation of air but between the each classroom and the corridor where it's transported is a special unit made by purpose only for this it means developed tested and so and so where is the damper for the noise where is the air fire protection flaps and the price of each of these unit was something like the price of one machine room of the, for the for the whole building, yeah, so it was extremely expensive because it was developed just for this purpose. Because there was demand, low pressure losses, of course, in this, but at the time the high efficiency from the noise protection, high efficiency and the, of course the fire protection. So we should be. And at the beginning it was the great idea. Somebody said, okay, so let's do it this way. It's fantastic. But yeah. as the design was going on and on, we got to the to a moment that it was necessary to install something because the fire protection set. No possibility to make just opening uh, noise, of course, the hygiene service set, another thing. I think the problems with the residential buildings with the tight windows are known and so the, it's a typical diagram of, of the one of the refurbished, renovated, energy efficient building. So here's the temperature, this is the 20 degrees, here's the relative humidity, 90% of the relative humidity. And it's one week in the apartment where I was living one person, renewed building with the new tight windows. Of course, no mechanical ventilation in this. So the lady who was living there, they, she was, was, was washing their clothes inside, drying it at home, and she had a lot of flowers. Nothing special, but she has a lot of flowers at home. So the result was completely destroyed apartment and uh, problem and she did a mistake which was very funny because somebody told her if you will decrease the temperature in your room one degree you will save approximately 13 percent of energy for heating she said okay i would like to save energy for heating so she turned uh, down the heating system so the average temperature was something about uh, 19 degrees so it was not so low but at the moment the relative humidity jump up and the whole system was, was collapsed. So that's the results. Concerning light, we are in the period of something amazing, absolutely. I think it's a period of the steam 
100, 200 years ago, because every day, every month, you can find new version of LED lights, which are better and lower energy consumption. So our, let's say, knowledge in this field and our experience in this field is absolutely out, because for us, the light was always the heat load, heat gain, like the heat load for the, for the room. Uh, some kind of the problems with energy. So we, we developed many systems for transportation of daylight by such concentrators, by, by the light fibers into the rooms where it was distributed. But nowadays, isn't it easier to put a PV panel and the electricity from PV panel to send to LED? Maybe yes, maybe not, I don't know. But it's the challenge, it's the, it's the question for the future. Of course, the daylight is difficult to replace. The studies which are now done, have just been done, talking about the quality of LED light. And of course, if you look on the spectrum of the LED light, there is missing a lot of things which we do not see, but our brain probably is somehow interacting with it and we do not know what will happen to it us if you will live in the LED, not here, so it's okay. Uh, hot water, domestic hot water is one of the energy, energy consumers which is always very, very high and it's difficult to reduce it. We can do something with some types of the valves, that means starting from 60 liters per uh, shower with the traditional two valves like here in the hotel up to some thermostatic valve with a sensor where we can use the, where we can make the same comfort and same activity with approximately 20, 20 liters. Uh, Jean was talking about the water consumption and the presence of the people. So here are the curves of different weekdays in the, in the, in the one of the city. So it's a water consumption during the day and each curve is, is one weekday. So here is, here are the, here's the weekend. That means around the lunchtime, people are at home. And it's funny, this is the Saturday evening where nobody's at home, everybody's in the party. And here's the Sunday evening where everybody's taking a shower and bath. And so, yeah, so it's... If we try to reduce energy for hot water, one of the ideas is to reduce the temperature. Because typically at this moment, hot water is heated to 55 degrees up to 60, which is the temperature which is relatively safe regarding the microbiological, uh, uh, microbiological content of the, of the, of the water. Hmm? It's, a, it's, a, it's a bacteria which could, create, which could rise in the water. I will come to that. Yeah? So if we heat water for, to 55 to 60 degrees, it's, uh, it's okay, it's not, it's not growing. So if you came to the energy saving uh, measure that we will reduce the temperature because we do not need 55 degrees, we take a shower in 40 degrees. So we can heat up the water only for 40 degrees, but at the moment such bacteria could develop. So to go a little bit faster to the, to the end, any energy saving measure has impact to in the environment of the building and we should be aware of all those links. That means it's not possible to do anything with the changing of the indoor environmental quality and we should be aware about those links. In this topic is a short preview of the computational tools we can use for this evolution of energy performance of the buildings. So I will go very fast through that because we have not so much time. But what is important on this picture is that we should know if somebody will say, my energy use of the building is uh, 100 kilowatt hours per something to know what kind and in which place I measure this energy. If it is on the side of the energy needs, that means it's a theoretical value, or if it is energy which is delivered into the building, crossing the building envelope, or it is energy which is in the primary, like uh, expressed in the primary energy. So it's, pos it's important to know which point I'm describing and what I'm talking about. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding because if I say nearly zero energy building, for many people, it is this energy. That means they say, okay, I will not pay. It's, I will need no energy in my buildings, but it's not true, of course, because we are talking about the primary energy and generally it's about non-renewable primary energy which is just part of this. So in this point I'm able to create a zero energy building, in this point it's difficult. 
Uh, here's just a preview that we have different ways how to get to the prediction of behavior of the building. So from the scaled models, from the real size models, up to the um, simulation, different ways of the computer programs based on the data driven. That means we have data and we analyze it and make a prediction based on that or we have the typical that we have a set of the equations which is describing the physics of the building. When to use it, here are ideas which points we can, we can speak about, about the uh, energy performance of the building. So uh, it's different in the early phase, non-standard uh, building elements and, and so. <clears throat> Tip for search of the tools, I think the, for those who are working in this field, you know about this web page, which is trying to summary all building energy software tools and it's very good place where you can find basic information. So typical design builder, Transys, IDA, ESPR, so are tools which are used for that such purposes. What I would like to end with is and to conclude is the BIM, which is, uh, let's say, topic which is very, very hot now. Uh, starting from those such pictures that not always <laughs> everything is working properly as so the doors, uh, the, the ceiling is somehow obstructing the <laughs> such things, such toilet is not fully functional, I think. And here it's, I cannot imagine how to, how to work with that. Yeah. So idea in background is to create virtual model of the building, which will be equal to the existing building. And on this model, I can do everything what I need. That means starting from the, uh, starting from the uh, sizing of the equipment, continue with the calculation of the energy balances and to complete uh, with the facility management. So in the BIM, we have seven or three to seven D. So starting from 3D, which is a picture, up to 7D, which is the facility management. That means the virtual reality parallel to the existing buildings and everything what will happen in the real building will be transferred into the virtual reality. Okay, so I think this is the last point which I wanted to show you. Thank you very much for attention and uh, we can discuss during the workshop and everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.